This morning is Bonnie Wildey who comes to tell us a story about archives, access and a dress with pockets. <laughs> yes, I'm officially wearing a hashtag good dress, so this is a good start. Um, so welcome to my session. I did plan on being able to see some notes, but that's okay. I can wing this. Um, so my session, because I can read, is called Wearing Access, a story about open collections, a sewing machine and the nation's secrets. Um, so welcome and thank you for turning up. My name is Bonnie Wildey and I am an archivist, a librarian, an historian, a maker. Um, and so throughout this presentation, I will sort of be talking to you from the perspective of both, both the historian researcher and also the glam professional. So for those of us just walking in, a little reminder about what GLAM is. So we've got our galleries, we've got our libraries, we've got our archives and we've got our museums. And it's all very fabulous. Um, <laughs> so who here in the room is from GLAM, works in an institution? I'm not used to being in the minority, my goodness. Okay, and the rest of you are looking to collaborate with us, is that right? Oh, we love you, this is exciting. I'm so excited. Okay, this is gonna be great. Um, I would also, and I am going to be asking for participation and not in the awful, awful, awful way where you have to actually do anything. I'm just asking, I know, right? It's awful. Um, I'm, asking, <laughs> I'm asking for you to, I used to t torture my students that way. Um, I'm asking you to tweet along with this and I may at points throughout the presentation ask you to tweet. Now, if you would um, like to do that, I would be hugely appreciative. Um, and if not, you don't have to, that's, that's fine. I'll allow it this time. <laughs> I'll allow it. So we'll just move through. Okay, so this is a story of how I became an open access remix art example. And I was just as surprised as you are that it was happening. Um, but it's all been very exciting. And this is a story about how it occurred. And it has a lot to do with archives and um, a wizard named Tim Sherritt and um, open access and a really um, beautiful online collaborative community. So this is a, a really fab story. But before we start, I have this question here. And the question is, how does the National Archives of Australia know that I am currently wearing their records? How do they know? Can they know? Now, I'm hoping I get lucky. Are you from National Archives? No, I'm wondering. <laughs> Maybe you have a heat-activated RFID chip in your dress. Oh, spoiler alert. No. Okay. <laughs> what I was hoping for, because we could all head out to lunch early, is, is someone here from the National Archives of Australia? I'm so disappointed. Okay. So we could have done an all-staff email, a few pictures. I have no doubt. Hello, National Archives. Hello, ASIO. Yeah. Um, is anyone here from ASIO? Um, so what I am wearing is the National Archives of Australia records and these are ASIO files. So I'm wearing uh, records, surveillance records from or created by the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, ASIO. I'm wearing their stuff. They look like animals. They do look like animals. They do look like animals. What these are, this is a little movement called redaction art. Okay, and I'll talk about it more in a moment. And this isn't my discovery, and I'll talk about whose discovery it is. But these are redaction art critters. So these were made from um, a person undertaking redaction of ASIO files. Okay, so these are obscuring information that we're not allowed to know. Okay. These, the bird, the robot, the emu, I can't believe we can't trust an emu. Is he there? Yes, he is. They all obscure information that we're not allowed to know. The lacks of censorship, but they're all so cute. So hello, ASIO, good friends. So what I want to do is <laughs> I want to start a conversation. 
okay? And this is where you guys come in. So this is conversation time. This is where I want you to tweet if you want to. If you don't, that's fine. But what I would ask if you want to contribute is that we tweet the National Archives of Australia, NAA, G-O-V-A-U, and let them know that we are engaging with their ASIO re redactions here at LCA 2018. Okay, tweet, please, please. Hand up when you finish. We've got one, one. They're going to love this. Their social media person's going to love this. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so these files, these are held in the National Archives of Australia um, and they've digitised them and they've made them accessible. So thank, thank you very much, National Archives of Australia. But this isn't just a story about National Archives records. This dress or these pictures are the story of that Wizard of Glam Tim Sherratt's work. Okay, so this I'm wearing is also the pr product of a researcher, someone engaging with these objects and doing amazing stuff with them. So we can't just leave, um, leave it at National Archives in this conversation. We also need to bring Tim Sherratt in so at W-R-A-G-G-E. So we need to let Tim know that he's an absolute wizard, um, that we are working with Redaction Art here today at LCA 2018. So if you would, if, you, if you're so inclined, if you could tweet at Tim, that would be fabulous. And then just a hand up to let me know when you've, when you've tweeted. I'm sure we're all following Tim already, aren't we? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Beautiful. Okay. So this is really nice stuff. Um, so just to recap, we started a conversation. We've let the National Archives know that we're talking about their collection. We've let Tim know that we're talking about his research. And I want to take us back to the beginning here. So this is, um, this is a, an incredible story of um, Tim working with the digitised ASIO files held at the National Archives of Australia. So Tim started out, or it's a story really of um, harvesting these digitised files, attempting to automate um, locating redactions within these files, and then in the process of doing this, finding art. Now, if you weren't following, I was following um, online via Twitter as Tim was tweeting his research. So it, it really um, ties in with what we talked about this morning in the keynote about this, this stuff happening in real time and it, it's very collaborative and um, we have very real results immediately. So that's what was happening here. If you weren't lucky enough to sort of see this first time round, you can go and um, visit the Storyfy that Tim has made of this. And in the nature um, of open source, Tim also has an online um, notebook, research notebook that you can go, can go and see and his research experiments, tools are all available online there. So I would urge you to, to very much go and track that information down. So I have a few tweets here. This is how we start out. So this is um, a page in the file, okay, and for some reason we can't know who this was to. So it's got its own redaction. We can't see the signature here that's been redacted. And we can see that this is t Tim's progress with actually being able to identify these redactions within the records. Okay, so he's tweeting this out for us. So it starts like that. He gets a nice collection of blobs, which are great. Starts to get a little bit more shapely, I guess. What does he say? What does he say? Artistic splodges, I think is quite lovely. We move past artistic splodges into an incredible boat. Okay. Look, we've all been there though, haven't we? Doing that boring task and we turn our regional director's name into a boat. Of course we have. Of course we had. Or we turn him into some sort of sausage dog. I, I quite like this. This is 
this is quite nice. So this this was this was um, so engaging to see. And I mean, by this stage, we've reached redaction art hashtag. You know that this. <laughs> It is 1 a.m. Thank you, Hugh. This is um, this is fab stuff, and it's um, happening in real time, and it's happening, and it's shared, and it's just all beautiful. So what happens now is that Tim collects these um, amazing critters, and he puts them online for us to use. Okay. Redaction art, because it does get its own hashtag, it enters the wild, okay? These little, little critters go nuts. So here we are, um, we have tattoos. So you can have your redaction art tattoo. We have, these are highly sought after. We have our redaction art brooches, okay? So these are, these are laser cut brooches. So these are all redaction critters. And you can see here that we have our National Archives of Australia, okay, NAA. We have our series number. I'm sure we're all across the Australian series system. Yes, yes. Um, our series number, we have our record number and we have a page number. So we are always, of course, linking back into the, um, the records from this point. Okay, and don't you think that's delicious? Right? Yeah, okay. And, and Tim has written on that and I'll, I'll speak a little bit in a minute. So we've had our tattoos, we've had our brooches, we've had our 3D printed cookie cutters. <laughs> so this is um, the 3D printing occurring in the University of Wollongong's makerspace. Okay. It is awesome, isn't it? And this here is, um, I just love this so much. So this is two um, cookie cutters that were made by Edward Shadow for Tim Sherritt, and they got to him via, um, oh my gosh, yes, I've, I've forgotten her name. I only know her by her Twitter handle. Anyway, by um, two people here, um, and this just shows what kind of network we have in GLAM and how involved everyone is in this project, and it's just fab and it's awesome and I love it. So, tattoos, yes, brooches, 3D printed cookie cutters, you know what's coming next. It's the biscuits. <laughs> okay, so we have reduction art cookies, which is fab. So um, these were made using those cookie cutters and they were handed out at the Digital Humanities Pathways Forum in Canberra in 2017. We have a reduction art cake. <laughs> so this was made by Kirsten Wright um, for International Archives Day um, with that statement that we can do better. Okay, so I want you to keep in mind that we're now entering into this sort of subversive world. And here is the redaction art dog that sits down, the, sits down the bottom there. So we've got cake and we've also got an exhibition. So there's Tim Sherritt um, exhibiting this at the Belcon and Art Centre. So you can see that this is an incredible movement with lots of people getting involved. Um, and a lot of that stems from tweets like this from Tim. So it's very collaborative and it's very much about sharing and it's very much about um, contributing. So make your own hashtag redaction art. The SVG files I use to create my badges and tattoos are all here, from ASIO to you. Okay? So all of you here can go and grab these files and contribute something awesome to this conversation. So I saw this and I'm like, I want to contribute. I want to be awesome. Um, what can I do? So I don't have a 3D printer at home. Um, I was like, I'm not going to 3D print something. But I can crochet and I can sew. And so I thought, well, I'll make something along those lines to contribute and to make a bit of a statement. And I just want to segue just a little bit. Um, Chris is here at the conference. I think she's very busy in another awesome little mini con. Um, but I want to draw attention to this and her um, you know, frustration that maker culture is 80% male. Because what it does is it's excluding makers that we maybe label as crafters, okay? Those that sew and knit and weave and do those kind of things. 
And I think for those of us in um, cultural heritage institutions, we need to really be thinking about who our makers are and what we actually think about as a maker when we create our maker spaces and when we think about people engaging with our cultural heritage and when we think about the types of files that we release and the formats that we release. So who are our makers and are we thinking in terms of this 80% male maker culture or is it more inclusive? Okay, so that's a little segue, um, but I think it's important to note. So what I was going to do, what I decided I was going to do is sew. And the thing that jumped to mind straight away was one of my favourite collection items. This is the press dress and it's held in the State Library of Victoria. Has anyone seen it, heard of it, come across it before? Some of you, yes, no? Okay, so it is absolutely fabulous and I'm going to go into it in a minute. Um, but essentially, a lady called uh, Matilda Butters wore this dress in 1866 and this is a custom printed dress. And I'll talk a little bit more about the elements in just a second, but first of all, it's conversation time. So we're going to shout out to the Library of Victoria, the State Library of Victoria, and say thank you for making... So I can get a picture. Yeah. Absolutely. There you go. No. It's fabulous. I understand. No problem. Beautiful. Okay, so if we can um, shout out to the State Library of Victoria and let them know that we are discussing a collection item today, the press dress, and to thank them for making that available online to us today. That would be fabulous. This is a first time round. This is an experiment. You just gave it away. We were in the middle of an experiment. So <laughs> this is going to be very interesting in about half an hour when we look at the results. Beautiful. OK, so we've shouted out to the State Library of Victoria for sharing the press dress with us. So here's a, another shot of it. Um, so just to walk you through what we have here. So remember, it's 1866, so we're not a federation yet. Um, so, colony pride is very important. Anyone here from Victoria? Yes, okay, <laughs> beautiful. So, you're going to love this. Um, so, this is a dress made up of 14 main panels. And this is uh, white silk. And each panel is printed from a newsprinter um, page, the press. Okay, and they talk about this being such a, a work of art when it comes to Australian printing because it's still legible all these years later. Okay, so it's remarkable just in that instance. So, 14 uh, pages. Down here, and unfortunately we can't see too clearly here, but in these panels here are the names of the Victorian newspapers. So, Melbourne gets the main pages. Okay, and then the rest of the newspapers are sort of down the side here. Um, th that's not the original bodice, the bodice is gone, um, but that's okay. Now, when Matilda wore this, she also had an accompanying coronet that said, Liberty of the Press. <laughs> and she wandered around the ball carrying a mini functioning printing press from which she printed during the night. What? I know, I know. It's just so fab. She's just so great. Um, now, there's a, few, there's a few things going on here. And before that, I just want us to take particular note of this here. Who's used Trove before or heard of Trove? Yes. Oh, beautiful. So many hands. Um, so what I've done here is that I've just, as you do, look up a page from the dress on Trove, and here it is, okay? So the Australian News for Home Readers, um, this was done in August, so she wore the dress in October. So that's not a huge gap, really, is it? But there you go, dress and the actual page on Trove. So you know what I'm going to do when I click this button. 
We're going to shout out to Trove. <laughs> Um, but we really need to shout out to Trove because what they've done um, for GLAM with regards to open access is just so important. And I know that we'll be hearing a little bit more about that later on today. Um, but words can't describe it. So lots of exclamation marks in this tweet when you tweet at Trove to say just how fabulous we think they are. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Beautiful. Oh, for the video, everyone's tweeting. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. So, there's a few um, elements to unpack with Matilda Butter's dress. And the first is that dressing as the press was not a particularly, like it wasn't like an original idea. Um, the newspapers, when they write about her, they say that... Uh, this impersonation has occurred in, and these, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the accent's real. Um, is, <laughs> sorry. Um, has been undertaken in um, England and on the continent, but it's been done in a very inferior way compared to how wonderfully we've done it in Melbourne. Because, come on, <laughs> the colony of Victoria competes with Paris or England any day of the week. Um, so it had been done previously, like it was a character that you could dress as, just as you would go as Marie Antoinette or you would go as, um, uh, oh, I don't know, Desdemona or something like that, you know, like it was a character that you could go with. And this here is the description of how to dress as the press character. And it gives, um, I quite like this, um, the skirt consists of illustrations from papers coming to the waist with portraits and blah, blah, blah. Like this sort of details what we saw on um, Matilda's dress. What I do like here is for those of us who are saving money, we can rewear the dress if we just add some postage stamps. And we can go as postage. How fabulous. Okay, um, but this is uh, quite common. This is instructional. So, you know, you would pick your fancy dress from a book. You know what I'm going to ask you to do? Okay, so this was, um, this is from the 1880s and it's from a book called uh, Fancy Dresses Described. <laughs> um, and it, it's fabulous and you can access this at the Internet Archive. So um, the, the Internet Archive has partnered with the University of California Libraries to make this particular item um, available online. So conversation time, we're going to say thank you to the Internet Archive for making this available to us to use today. Beautiful. Excellent. Okay. So I'm not sure how that is displaying for you, but here's Matilda in her fabulous gown down here, holding the printing press. So we know that Matilda, she got quite a bit of notice both before and after this particular outing because of the dresses that she wore. And she was really clever when it came to constructing these. So she takes a known form, right? And then she shapes it. So she chooses the pages to go into this dress to have meaning. This whole dress is imbued with meaning. Remember that she's wearing this dress to the ball to welcome the new governor of Victoria. Okay? So she chooses a panel on the dress that has his portrait on it. It's going to get you noticed, okay? But she also chooses a panel that has a picture of the new town hall, okay? Progressive Melbourne, progressive Victoria, proclaiming the colony to this new arrival, okay? It's powerful stuff. What she also does is in the first outing, because she wears this a few times, she adds second edition the next time she wears it. I love it. It's fabulous. Um, so she prints in the first incarnation of this, 
She prints lines from Byron's poem, Lara. Is anyone familiar with that poem? No, 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 yes, yes. Okay, so in that poem, Lara returns from abroad to manage his estates. And he has some initial successes and things go quite well until they don't. So he gets caught up with the local warlords and they kind of undermine him and he gets involved with petty stouches and then it sort of, I don't know, goes quite badly and ends in warfare. So, you know, you've got this newcomer in the position of power, starts off okay and then everything turns into chaos. Was Matilda, by printing those throughout the night, offering some words of advice to the new governor? It's speculation only. I can't, I can't know. We can't know. Um, but possibly there was a statement in that. What is interesting, though, is that she was printing those lines, given Byron's um, significant problems with actually his own copyright and his own intellectual control over his work. Um, so there's a little added layer there. What we do know is that clothing can be subversive. We understand the cultural norms that come with the clothing that we wear and we can subvert them. We understand that there are power structures in the clothing that we wear. And I only need to mention pussy hats for you to understand what I mean when a, a, a clothing item can become a visual symbol of process, protest or that wearing certain clothes, say, uh, you know, Renaissance sumptuary laws wear, particular items of apparel are denied to particular classes because of what they represent. So when we understand that, we can use dress and costume to be subversive, okay? And that's what Matilda did. She, she wanted to be noticed, she wanted to be made impact and she wanted to start a conversation. Okay? So before we move on, I just want to acknowledge two resources that I used for the bibliographical and contextual information of that story. And the first one is the Australian Dress Register. Has anyone used the Australian Dress Register? I'll oh, do check it out. It's fabulous. You can look at the Communist Party leader's suit. It's great. <laughs> Um, but the uh, Australian Dress Register is a place where you can go to access the costume, not the costume, the clothing history of Australia. Um, so it is um, glam institutions around the country contributing content to that resource and it operates under a Creative Commons licence. And it comes out of the Powerhouse Museum, otherwise known as the Museum of Applied Arts and Science. So if you could tweet at um, the Powerhouse to let them know that we enjoyed hearing about an item that is actually held in the um, Australian Dress Register. That would be fabulous. Beautiful. Okay, this is great. So my redaction art plan, because remember that's what I was talking about, um, was to be inspired by the press dress. Okay, um, custom printing, and I wanted it to be a little bit subversive. Okay, I wanted to have those um, elements that would initiate conversation. So my next question was, could I get crafty with glam? And I, ha I had a recollection that perhaps I could. So I dug through some um, uh, research material that I had for some teaching I was doing. And there was a 2014 blog post from Melissa Terrace, who is a digital professor of digital cultural heritage. Um, and she wrote about um, getting crafty with glam and highlighted some of the difficulties around it. And in the blog post, um, not only highlighted examples of people doing really fabulous stuff with our open collections, but also um, putting across some points of view of, of what institutions could actually do better to enable um, and encourage reuse and remix of cultural heritage collections. So I had a look at that. I took um, some inspiration from her with regard to using spoon flour to get some custom um, fabric printed. And then the actual process of going from redaction art to redaction art dress was really simple because I just went to GitHub where Tim had placed the redaction art. 
I rearranged the images until I was happy with something that was sort of haphazard like this, as you can see. And then I made it black because I like wearing black dresses. Um, and that was it, really. Placed an order in about three weeks. I had 2.5 metres of cotton awesomeness and I was ready to go. Okay, so the next step was to announce um, to the world that I had joined the Redaction Art Movement. And so I thought this tweet by Tim, on International Archives Day, make yourself some Redaction Art jewellery from ASIO files. Okay, again, just note here that there is that invitation to be making. So make it yourself. Um, I went, right, okay, it's time, here we go. I can't 3D print, but I can sew. Yay! Okay, so just out of shot here is a very helpful cat. Um, <laughs> but you can see here, so there's the Redaction Art fabric in full and then with the pattern on there, ready to go. And from there, I then... <laughs> I then tweeted the process of making the dress, okay? Um, all the time using the hashtag Redaction Art, um, so that we could link what was happening here, so that I could be part of the conversation. But pulling in other elements as well. So, you know, this seems quite innocuous. ASIO Redaction Dress um, Update. Can you imagine what my file looks like? Anyway, <laughs> ASIO Redaction Dress Update. We now have pockets for all the secret things, okay? And there's some pockets going in. Um, but what we need, and it does indeed have pockets, um, but what we need to even just think about here with pockets is that pockets are political. Like, you guys may not realise that, but pockets for women, it's a political action. Pockets are gendered, pockets are political. Um, the denial of pockets is a denial of female freedom, and I'm not going to go into it too much here because there's so much online. Right, okay, we're ditching this, we're talking about pockets. Um, <laughs> But, you know, this inability of women to have secret things, right? And it doesn't matter what kind of secrets they are, but that denial is important. So this is a, a broader context, I think, because remember how I wanted my dress to be a little bit subversive? <laughs> so, secret things, um, finishing the evening with sleeves, night-night ASIO redaction critters. These, uh, I quite like that. As you're overlocking, you see, and you know, oh, well, that's a bit important. Um, so, Crafternoon of Sewing Tea and National Secrets, as we all do. And then, final product. So, ASIO Redaction art, art Dress is finished, and it's absolutely the greatest thing I own, and I stand by that. It is fabulous, and I love it so much. So, that was the Redaction Art Dress. And then things got a little bit nuts. <laughs> Because I got a text message from my friend to say, um, Tim's talking about your dress in his DH um, Pathways Forum uh, talk. And I'm like, what? Get out. Anyway, no, there it is. So there's the proof. So there's the, the dress looking amazing against this tessellated wall, which I just love. So this was down in Canberra at the um, Digital Humanities Pathways Forum 2017. Um, here it is in Germany as part of Liam Wyatt's Wikimedia Culture and the Memory of the World keynote speech. Now, you can watch this on YouTube and I would urge you to go and check it out because he's got, I mean, this is there at about 37, 54 minutes if you're interested. Um, but the whole thing's great. The whole thing's great. But no, I would definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and I think, for me, I want us to just hold on to this comment here. So when Liam is describing what we've done with Redaction Art, he says, wonderfully bizarre and fun and interesting, and talks about, the, talks about and shares the history of archival collections in a way that an archive itself would never do. So the question is, why? Why? Why would an archive never do this themselves? Okay, let's keep that in mind. So, we also um, ended up in Denmark as part of Sharecare. So, this was Tim Sherritt talking about his redaction artwork there. Um, again, very excited. That's myself and my friend. 
up on the screen together um, in just a little example of how teeny tiny the glam world is. Okay, you can end up in a presentation together and not even know it. <laughs> I also added to this story of um, the redaction art. So um, last year, the National, sorry, the New Librarian Symposium was held in June and it coincided with the 80th anniversary of ALIA. So ALIA is the Australian Library and Information Association, well, it's our professional association, it's in the name. Um, and what was going to happen is that we were going to do a recreation of this historic moment, I'm sure you all know and it's marked on your calendar, the first um, meeting or the inaugural meeting of what would become ALIA. Okay, 80 years in front of Albert Hall, we were going to recreate that. And I went, oh, I've got to do it, don't I? I have to get the dress in. But it's June. Canberra's cold. No, no. So there were a lot of reasons to want to um, to want to do this, and I, I did sort of ask permission. That might be too too small to read. I was like, should I should I wear this? Because I did have, I did have a workshop scheduled with Tim that morning, <laughs> and I was like, I can't wear the dress and then turn up wearing the dress made from the work of the person. Like, that's going to be weird. But it was fine because he actually recognised me in the car park at the National Library before we had the session, and I was so embarrassed, I paid, like, for a million dollars worth of car park. So <laughs> it all turned out really well, which is good. Um, but no, so I was like, you know what? This dress has so much meaning, it needs to get into that. Um, this dress embodies questions around access, around surveillance, around the maker movement, around open culture. Um, I wanted to get that dress in there. So I made the decision to wear it. And there's another little hidden part, which I think is really important. What I'm showing you here is an ASIO file. Does anyone recognise the name Metcalf? Oh, it's just the founder of the Library Professions Professional Association. Okay, so what we were celebrating, the guy who started that has his own ASIO file. Okay, ASIO <laughs> had Metcalf under surveillance during the 40s and 50s. Awesome. Isn't that rad? So here we go. We've got his ASIO file, we've got redaction. So already there's information that we can't possibly know in this file. So why was Metcalf under surveillance? Well, it turns out, and again, this is quite small, I've left it deliberately um, as they present it online, just to give you an idea of what these records look like. Um, but Metcalf had a habit of hanging out with radicals like Dr. Evert, who was a suspected communist, and Jessie Street, who was a known feminist. My goodness, <laughs> my goodness. So that's detailed there. And it turns out as well, and again, this is how the record is presented, that if you suggest that public libraries should be alternatives to propagandist bookshops, it gets you noticed by ASIO. Now, <laughs> I don't understand what's wrong with that, but it turns up in his file. So again, that's quite small. The good news is you can look that article up on Trove to find out what Metcalf was saying. Um, so how can I not wear this dress? To know that our uh, the person who created our professional association was under surveillance by ASIO. It's crazy. So take that on board. I, I wanted to bring all that together and in a sort of cultural stenography, I guess, I've got this now sort of hidden Easter egg in our little Insight magazine. So I'm there holding the eye for information <laughs> in the ASIO redaction dress. It's just so fab. So I think we can, um, I think we can take a few things away from this. <laughs> Redaction art has gained physicality. It's begun, it's become something that we wear and something that we proclaim loudly. The people who wear these are sort of in a secret society. 
And it's a secret society that you gain access to based on critical engagement with these records, but with the broader questions around open access, surveillance, open glam, and what, what, what glam actually really means. So I am going to have to wrap it up there. And I had so much more to say to you, but that's fine. Um, I will definitely talk at anyone who wants to just listen about, <laughs> about what Glam can do better. No? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I, I do have um, a whole list of points. I don't know what happened. I got talking. Um, but I do want us to just, you know, one last thing is when we think about, as cultural heritage institutions, when we think about engagement with our collections, when we think about engagement with open glam, this engagement is more than a citation. It is reflective, it is critical, and it is creative. It can't be measured in website statistics or uh, website downloads. It's a tattoo. It's a badge and it's a dress. And we need to be involved in this conversation. Okay? So at this point, tell me how your phones are going. <laughs> Have we got replies? Have we got responses? Yeah. Yes? Who? Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Hang on. Um, Tim, Tim told me that um, he could be a fashion designer because he was Excellent. Good. So Tim's involved. Anyone else? Yeah, um, Edward Shadows actually tweeted the link to um, the file to make the cookie cutters. Excellent. Great. Excellent. Wonderful. This is all good stuff. And I did actually have an, a, a, a secret exchange with Edward Shadow, and I only know him as Edward Shadow, um, but at National Library. Um, so I have one of those cookie cutters. Anyone else? Any of our institutions? <coughs> Kirsten Wright with the cake has responded. Okay, good. But critically, have any of our institutions responded? Not to me. Not, as, not that I can see yeah. anyone. They're probably having a conversation about this or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're probably all calling each other. What is going on? Yeah. Okay, so I do want us to think about that. I do have to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Um, I apologise that I didn't have the full presentation for you, but I think this has been fun and given us a lot of things to think about. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.